You shall live in the region of Goshen and be near me. You and your children, your grandchildren, your flocks and your herds and all you have. Go to Genesis 46. Verse 28. Now Jacob sent Judah ahead of him to Joseph to get directions to Goshen. And when they arrived in the region of Goshen, Joseph had his chariot made ready and went to Goshen to meet his father in Israel, his father Israel. As soon as Joseph appeared before him, he threw his arms around his father and he wept a long time. Chapter 47 now, verse 5. Pharaoh said to Joseph, your father and your brothers have come to you. In verse 6, and the land of Egypt is before you. Settle your father and your brothers in the best part of the land. Let them live in Goshen. Go to verse 27 of that same chapter. Now the Israelites settled in Egypt in the region of Goshen. They acquired property there and were fruitful and increased greatly in number. All right, go to the book of Exodus. Guess what it's about? Goshen, you got it. Verse 22 and 23, and then we'll pray and I'll preach to you. But on that day, I will deal differently in the, with the land of Goshen, where my people live. No swarms or flies of flies will be there. So that you will know that I, the Lord, am in this land. I will make a distinction between my people and your people. This miraculous sign will occur tomorrow. Let's pray. Father, we thank and praise you for your goodness towards us. For all that you did, Lord, in the last service. What you have done already in the time of worship. The building, offering, the daily seed and the giving that's taken place. And returning the tithe. We ask that you'd move in great power. Would you just pray if you have the freedom to pray in your heavenly language? Go ahead and do that. Ask God to speak to you. Move in power. We'll not stop you. Release all that's in your heart, God, today. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Please excuse my gravelly voice as I've been overcoming some vocal cord challenges. I've been connected to a cold that I've had. You know, where you live makes a difference. I've lived in a lot of beautiful places. I've been a lot of places around the world. And of course, everywhere I moved to, I had the not so unique revelation that wherever I went, there I was. <laughs> I've seen people try to change their lives by moving, it never works because uh, there you are in your new place making the same challenges and problems that you made before. If you try to run from your problems, they will find you because they're many times within you and you're the one that's creating them. Hallelujah. This text talks of this land of Goshen. And uh, right in your notes, where you live makes a big difference. My mom, my mama was here in the first service. She moved up from Florida. Florida is just getting ready for hurricane season. If you live in Florida, you better have storm shutters. You better know what's up when they call for a hurricane. You heard of Hurricane Katrina there in, in New Orleans. You ever lived there before? You live in the south. You're going to have storms like that that will come your way. And you'd best be prepared. You live by the ocean. There's a thing called tsunamis. And uh, you better be prepared for that. God forbid you ever find yourself in a hurricane or a tsunami. Or maybe you've lived in the plains of America. You lived in the plains of America. You better have a basement or a root cellar or know where your neighbor's is. Because by and by there's probably going to come a twister. And if you don't have a place to find shelter, it might be a little bit difficult. Where you live will affect you economically. Where you live will affect you politically. Where you live will affect you socially. Where you live will affect you environmentally, culturally, and every other area of your life. I want to preach to you a message about living in the blessings of God. I want to talk to you about packing your bags and moving to Goshen. I want you to live under the blessing of God 
It is not God's will, God's design, God's plan for you to live under bondage. It's not God's will, God's plan for you to live under fear, to be staying in a place of low to bar and discouragement. It's not God's will for you to stay there. You need to pack your bags and move if that's where you're at. It's not that we don't go through difficulty. Well, we'll go through it. But living in, under the blessings, living in a place called Goshen, as it is with Israel here. Goshen, let's look at our notes. So the place that we can live is amazing is Goshen, the blessings of God. I heard Dr. Morocco a number of years preach a message on this. He called it living in the God space. What is Goshen? Well, we're unsure. If I give you, as I give you the background, we're unsure exactly what Goshen is. The name is uncertain. Uh, we do know that it's Semitic, meaning Hebrew. <coughs> Excuse me. And there is a Goshen, uh, you can read Joshua 15, there's a place of, called Goshen in the promised land that is different than the Goshen here in Egypt. In fact, Joshua 15, 15 talks about a Goshen in Palestine. It's a very different, different location. It seems to be the place where Joseph lived in Egypt, or at least nearby. And uh, you see that in Genesis 45, 10. We, we read that. Dwell here in the land of Goshen, so you'll be near me. Um, there's archaeological finds. Pardon me. <coughs> Here, take a praise break. I'll be right back. <coughs> you guys are crazy. What's up? We might have to do that just a couple times, so get used to it. If I say take a praise break, just say thank you, Jesus. All right? Let's practice. Take a praise break. Thank you, Jesus. You got it. You got it. You got it. Okay. You got it. All right. That's good. That was good. Um, so it seems to be a place where Joseph lived in Egypt. There's been archaeological finds uh, all, of course, throughout that area. In Genesis 47, uh, verse 11, it's a place called Ramesses or Ramses. It's, it's the same place. It's, and they've done archaeological finds and actually found palaces there and stuff. The text that we've read is significant, uh, not only spiritually, but it's significant spiritually as I bring the application. So I'm going to talk about, let me just line it out, I'm going to talk about Goshen and the context of the passage that we read in the life of Joseph. All of these messages are available online for you. You can get them on YouTube, and there are so many different ways to get them, YouTube, podcast, streams off the website, it's on the app. All of them. I think we're in message 14 in the life of Joseph. It's changed my life, really. And this is the time now where Israel, or Jacob, Jacob and Israel, it's the same person. Of course, Jacob wrestled with the angel of the Lord and got a name change from deceiver to prince of God. That's what Israel means. And they're now coming out of Canaan's land by invitation of Pharaoh and Joseph, the long lost son, into Egypt to find uh, refuge in the midst of a tremendous famine that'll last for another five years. And so they're, they're arriving, and this is the, 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 the texts that cover that. And so the text describes Goshen and that Joseph lived nearby there. And then in, in Genesis 45.10, it says, You shall dwell in the land of Goshen, you shall be near me, you and your children, and your children's children. Goshen, it was a place of rebuilt relationships. There's so many things that happened for Israel there. So Goshen means a place of rebuilt relationships. Now, as I move through these components of the life of Joseph, I want you to start to make application as we go through. Goshen is living under the blessing of God. So you, me, all of us are supposed to live under a canopy of God's blessing. We're all supposed to live in a place called Goshen. And so in your life, these things should take place in your life if you're walking in the blessings of God. He said, well, not bless you. says, I'm came to church. No, you ain't blessed just because you ain't came to church. No, that's not the truth. I've had people that say, I think that God ought to thank me for coming. What kind of... That's a special kind of stupid. Come on, somebody say hallelujah. So it's a place where relationships are rebuilt. That you'll be near me. And there's tremendous 
restoration that happens here is amazing. I mean, they've been separated for 20 years. Joseph puts them through all these tests. They pass, and now Israel or Jacob, Joseph's father, comes. It was a place of provision. They're all provide for you. Come on, God will provide for you. It was a place of restoration, as I said already. Place of restoration. Relationships that were severed are now put back together in a place called Goshen. It was a place where they could do what they were called to do. In Genesis 47, verse 5 and 6, Pharaoh says, I'm giving you the best of the land so that you can tend your sheep. Now, what's amazing is to understand the tremendous um, disdain that Egyptians had for sheep herders. They did not care for Israelites whatsoever, but Joseph had saved the world. Joseph saved the world because of, his, because of the revelation of the dream and the application of it and being second in command, dungeon one day, second in command the next. Come on, God can change anything in your life. He can change it in one day. You might be feeling like you're in the dungeon today, but tomorrow everything can change. By this time tomorrow, I'm telling you, God can change anything. Let your hope rise. Let your faith rise. And so God fulfills the dream for Joseph, and they all bow down, and he becomes the second in command. And a, a nation that hated Canaanites, hated Israelites, is giving them the best part of the land. Why? Because they'd all be dead as a doornail if they had not listened to Joseph, but they did. And so now they welcome them into Egypt, and they give them the best of the land. Wow, kind of amazing. What a turnaround. Place of provision, place of restoration, place where they could do what they were called to do. They were sheep herders. And Pharaoh says, listen, find somebody who's really good at it and let them tend all of my sheep. You know, if you'll be excellent, if you'll be willing to do what it takes to be excellent at your job and excellent at what you do, then God will set you ahead of everybody else. Many people don't discipline themselves to be excellent. They have a gift and they rest in their gift, but they don't really train, don't really work hard at it. If you'll be willing to do what other people do part of the time, you'll be willing to do most of the time. God will elevate you and bless you and make you the head. And that's what he says, look for somebody competent. He looked for his best. How many of you know Joseph didn't look for the lazy slacker? They're all under the blessing. They're all moving to Goshen. But he, let me see that really diligent, hardworking, fast-moving shepherd who's really got, let me look for that guy whose sheep are really prospering. Who, who's, who's say, oh, so who's your best shepherd? Dad, who's the best shepherd we have? Oh, that's Bubba. Hey, Bubba, yeah. Well, you're going to be watching the, you got promoted. You got a big raise. You're watching Pharaoh's sheep. All right. Probably didn't go like that. Best of the land was to be for them. And what's fascinating is that they would own it. They owned this. Now things change under another leadership, under another leadership over the period of 400 years. New Pharaoh shows up isn't so appreciative of all the Israelites and how they've multiplied and they become slaves. But at this time, they own the land. Now, to understand fully what's taking place in Egypt, Pharaoh has listened to an Israelite who came from a dungeon, put him in second in command, by listening to his wisdom from God, saved the known world and Joseph's family also. Nobody has any wheat except Pharaoh. Everybody has to sell their land to buy from Pharaoh, except Israel. You understand when I say Israel, there's Jacob, who's a man who got a name change. His name is Israel. His whole family, the 12 tribes, in this case, the 12 brothers, if I could just simply put it that way, the 12 brothers, those are Israel. And so they don't have to sell their land. They got it like that. They got favor, and they're living in a place called Goshen. Wow. And they prospered there. They grew and multiplied exceedingly. How many of you wouldn't mind God multiplying you exceedingly? Wonderful. It was a place of protection, and that's why we read Exodus 8, verse 22 and 23. But you could read Exodus 9, 4, Exodus 9, 25. You could look at Exodus 10, 23. Goshen was this untouchable place. It was this place where there was no darkness, there's no flies, there's no, there's no pestilence. All of the ten main false gods of Egypt are defeated by the ten plagues that mocked them. They worshipped they worshiped the Nile. 
They worshiped all these different things. So when the ten plagues come, and God just sort of decimates all of their idols, all of their gods, none of those things were in that, in that God space. None of those things were in the Goshen. None of those things were under the canopy of God's blessing. Some say, wow, I want to live there. Yeah. How many of you want to live in the, how many of you want to live in the God space? How many of you want to live in Goshen? How many want to live under the blessing of God? Wonderful. You say, well, why, why would I need to do that? I mean, what's the, what's the point? Let me, uh, let me give you a couple things that will probably sober you up a little bit. The future of our nation, the future of the world is uncertain. I'm so thankful for, um, I think they're called memes. Is that right, Hannah? A meme? It's a picture with a little something on the bottom. You know, the people put it up on Facebook and Faceplant or whatever it is and but my, my mom, I had, had a picture, and said, you remember those old school pictures, and then you had like scripture on the bottom. So it was this, this photograph, and on the bottom of this fork in a road, there's two trails that went off, and it said on the bottom, never be afraid to trust an unknown future to a known God. I think I probably read it a hundred times. I don't know, I would look at it, I liked the picture. And uh, it was like a picture of Alaska or something. And I would look at it and just go, never be, I just need to trust God. Because I was afraid when I first came to the Lord. I didn't know what was going to happen. I didn't know how to make it. I didn't know, any, I, I mean, I had a bike. I didn't have a car. Hello. I didn't have a zip. So when I first came to the Lord, I'm thinking, man, I, I'm kind of a loser. Lord, what are you going to do with me? Jesus, help me. And, and it was just kind of the Lord saying, just get to know me, son. I'll take care of everything. Do you know that's true? I think he says the same thing to us today. You just keep growing in the knowledge of God. Keep your heart right. Be transparent. Seek first the kingdom of God. He adds all things. Come on, somebody say amen. And so, even though we're in a future that's uncertain, and as we go through some of these things that are potentially terrifying, as I'm about to communicate to you, you don't have to worry. You don't have to be in fear. Fear and greed drive the markets of the world, they should never drive the believer. They should, we should not be moved by fear. Stock market, moved by fear and greed. You and I should be moved by faith and generosity. And you will find every patriarch and everyone in Scripture, as they lived for God, as they lived in Goshen, as they lived under the blessings of God, they never had a problem. They're famine somewhere else, but not in my house. Economically, I'll give some different illustrations than I did in the first service. Does anybody remember a number of years ago, Cyprus decided, the, the nation decided to go ahead and take a third of everybody's money? Does anybody else remember that? Can you imagine being part of Cyprus and you wake up one morning and they've taken a third of your bank account? They said, well, we're taxing all of your... No, man, I work to make that... No, 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 actually, we're the government. They can just do whatever they want. Do you know, economically, all economists that's worth their salt all say the same thing. We are headed stream, just stream careening is the word, careening towards a parapet of an economic downfall that's beyond anything anyone has ever experienced. Praise break. <laughs> you guys just be like, Look like a West, West Texas frog in a hailstorm. <laughs> Let me give you a scenario of China. We, we owe them $1 trillion if they decide to, if their economy changes and things shift and they call in their $1 trillion, we have a major problem. And some say, well, that'll never happen because that'll destroy all the markets of the world. I'm no economist, but I have read a little bit and everything points to potential problem. Uh, in our lifetime. See, well, that's kind of concerning. Yeah. Better move to Goshen. Better move to, the, to, the, to the, the blessing of God, to being under the covering of God. Secondly, geopolitically, you know, we're pretty close to North Korea. The demonized tyrant of North Korea. By the way, I get political here. Don't really care about, about 
all the Johnson law. I think they're going to overthrow it. And even if they don't, I don't care. Because I'm not going to be hemmed in. I'm going to say it. I'm going to say it. And I'm going to say it again. I'm going to preach the gospel. I'm not going to be intimidated by somebody trying to put a cap on me. I think you appreciate that too. So North Korea, you know, you have a demonized despot there. And uh, he's a problem. And they are trying to mobilize a nuclear warhead. And they have discovered or they say that it's very possible uh, once he's able to do that, if he hasn't done it already, that he could hit Alaska from North Korea. Now, now that's a little concerning. That's a little concerning. I mean, you know, Lord, help our, our defense system up in Delta Junction. We have serious defense system all up and down the coast. I talk to military people, um, you know, people in high places will remain nameless. Most of them say this. Most of them say, oh, Pastor, I think we'll be on the ground in North Korea within the next 30 months or less. That's like, oh, whoa. Come on, somebody say, whoa. So you, you better have a place where you know everything's going to be all right. You better have a place where you know you're going to be provided for. You're going to be protected with. You're going to be protected that God's on your side. That you don't need to worry. Come on, somebody say amen. You better, you better know where you, what you know that God's got you. And you don't need to worry. You don't need to yield to fear. No matter what is, what or who is in office. Somebody say, y'all ought to move to Goshen. I'm already living there. Thanks, dear. I'm going to stay there. I'm going to do my best to stay in a place of the blessings of God. How foolish we think when we live and think that this is just it. Hey, nothing can go wrong. You remember 9-11, don't you? Yeah, things can go wrong. I'm not trying to put fear on you. I'm just trying to say, smell the coffee and understand you had best be connected to the God of heaven and, and know, know when he speaks and obey him and live for him and live in a place. And not, not, not having an argument about, about, well, I don't want to live, I don't want to do that because God's trying to take my fun or something. You know, culturally, culturally we live in a time of great frustration. If you're, if you're like I am, if you're a Christian that believes in biblical truth, Christians believe in biblical truth. That's not one of many truths. It's biblical truth. It's what's called absolute truth. So we believe what God's word says is true. So you can vote on the speed limit out front, but you can't vote on same-sex marriage. That's not even marriage. That's something else. Marriage is between a man and a woman, and that's defined in Scripture. And you, and you can't endorse something and say that it's right when Scripture says it's wrong. Listen, if you get offended right now, I'm not trying to offend you, but I'm going to preach the word unadulterated. And it's not so popular. I've, I, we came out of the governor's prayer breakfast yesterday, had the great joy of, of leading the prayer meeting along with a number of other pastors there before the breakfast. And just to, to hear different godly leaders and a tremendous message that was preached, very bold, very bold, in-your-face message about sin. I loved it. It was great. And we walked out into a gay pride parade. Now, I want you to hear me really clearly. We love people. God loves people. God, God doesn't hate people. He hates sin. So we love alcoholics. We love drug addicts. We love the fornicators, the adulterers, the homosexuals the sodomites. We love everybody. We just don't love the sin. And you can't call what God calls wrong. You can't call it right. Now, if that ticks you off and you're mad at me right now, just go read Romans. You're going to have to rip out a lot of scripture to throw away the truth that I just said. You say, well, what about my brother who struggles when we're going to pray for him? God can set him free. God can help him. And you love him with the love of Jesus. What about my sister? Or what about, you know, you love them, but you hold a standard. You don't change to conform to the world. You don't do that. And as we came out, Pastor Vince and I, Ebony and Ivory, we just felt led to 
walk right through the middle of it. And uh, we walked right through the middle of their, their thing, which was pathetically small. In Alaska, it was small. It was huge everywhere else. And to see the bondage and the broken hearts and, and, and people in shame trying to demand that something's right. And, and actually, why we walked across, they must have knew we were preachers or something. I don't know. I don't know. Looked straight at us, grown man in a dress. Looked straight at us, as bold as brass, and said, God loves gays. And I said, Amen. He's kind of shocked by that. And we went on and walked across in the midst, the crosswalk, and you went on then to talk about all the endorsements from the church they have. And he talked about the Episcopalian church. Hey, God bless the Episcopalians turning out today. Episcopalian pastor began to name some other ones. And, and I just sat there and I thought, man, we are so in the last days as it was in the days of Noah. So it'll be when the, son of, the, the coming of the Son of Man. Culturally, spiritually, you know, I shared in the first service, I don't want to take a bunch of time. Perhaps I took, took too much time in the first service. But in Revelation, you see a beast. Um, his name is Abaddon. Comes out of, the, out of the pit and leads these hordes. And they're released all over the earth. You know, I think actually that that's taken place already. And you can't look across every culture, nation, tribe, and tongue and not see the hordes of the demonic. Do you know that you could go to Walmart anywhere in America, go to Walmart at midnight, anywhere, any town in America? So why? Because you will see, of course you'll see regular folk, but you will also see like the night of the living dead. Not that I ever watched it, but it's like zombies. It's like a zombie apocalypse. I'm totally, am I the only one that's ever seen that? There's people that are strung out on meth. They're on drugs. They're trying to rip off people. Their eyes are falling out of their head. I'm telling you, we have an, on, on, there's an epidemic and Jesus Christ is the answer to set them free. Can you say amen? So, everybody say the Lord's coming soon. So we need to live in a place. Why do we need to live in Goshen? Why do we need to live under the blessings? Well, I just gave you some reasons. All right, how? How can we live in the place of the blessings of God? How can we live in the place? The first thing, all along in this series, we've talked about how Joseph is, like a, is a type of Christ. And we've seen that all along. And as Joseph suffered, and then he's brought to a place of elevation, and then all of Jacob or Israel is saved because of, of Joseph. It's, it's really fascinating. The first thing is, how do you live in Goshen? How do you move into the place of blessing God? The first thing is, you've got, you must be in covenant, right in the notes. You must be in covenant with the living God. You've got to be in covenant with the living God. Abraham was in covenant. Isaac was in covenant. Jacob was in covenant. Jacob, you see covenant two times in his life. You see when he runs away after stealing the birthright from his brother, he comes to a place called Bethel. And he sets up a stone there and he lies down there. And in that place he has a dream. And he sees a ladder. And he says the Lord is here. He wakes up and he calls that place. This is none other than the house of God. And he makes a covenant. He makes an agreement. He makes a contract with God. And says, if you bless me, I'll give you 10%. Blah, blah, blah. Makes this deal with, with the Lord. The other time we see Jacob in covenant is right here. We didn't, we didn't read it, but he goes on and he, and he makes his covenant with the Lord. The Lord says, go to Egypt and I'm going to bless you there. Go to Goshen. I'm going to bless you. And he sacrifices, which is a picture of worship also. The New Testament application would find Jeremiah 33 and 33, this new covenant that I'll make with you. Ezekiel 36, 26, I'll give you a new heart 
and put a new spirit in you. I'll remove from you the heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. It's talking about millennium later. God would send not Joseph, but Jesus, who would die on a cross, rise again from the grave, typified and shadows throughout all the Old Testament. Turn to Hebrews chapter 9. If you're going to live in the blessing, the first thing is you've got to live in covenant with God. Our sister Kathy, as I've quoted for years, God can't bless no mess. God can't bless you if you're not in covenant. Doesn't God love everybody? Oh, God loves everybody. Sure. But you're separated from His love because of sin. And the only way to be brought back into right relationship with Him is by receiving Jesus. Look at Hebrews 9, verse 15. Let me read from the Amplified and then we'll look on the screen here in a moment. For this reason, He is a mediator and negotiator of the new covenant. That is, an entirely brand new agreement uniting God and man. So that those who've been called by God may receive the full fulfillment of the promised eternal inheritance. Since a death has taken place as physical payment, which redeems them from the sins committed under the obsolete covenant. And now let's read this here. I think this is a New King James. For this reason, Christ is a mediator. I won't ask if you've ever been to mediation. That's a third party that try to work things out between two, uh, two others. Medi uh, mediator, there's a new covenant. So there's a new agreement. There's a new contract. By means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions or the sins, redemption of the transgressions under the first covenant, that those who called may receive the promise of eternal inheritance. Give me the new international version, please. If you're going to live in Goshen, you're going to move to Goshen, you ain't allowed in. You can't move there. It's a gated community. And those who come by the sheepfold gate can make their way in. But you may not enter in by any other means. So you would be a robber and a thief. For this reason, Christ is the mediator of the new covenant that those who were called may receive the promise of eternal inheritance now that he died as a ransom. See, the, the first thing of moving to Goshen, of moving into the blessings of God, you can't even go to the rest of them without this one. The key, the doorkeeper of the gate to the promised land of your life is Jesus Christ, him crucified, and the only way you can enter in is by believing on him. Come on, somebody say amen. amen. Believe also you got to be a worshiper, and we see this right in the text. It's the first thing Jacob does. Genesis 46, 1. He comes and he worships. If you're going to live in the blessings of God, you got to be in covenant with him. And then I believe you need to be a worshiper. You need to be ongoing worshiping the Lord. And I, I think that means going to church, but I think it means being the church. I, I really believe that God wants you to become a full-time worshiper. Yeah. Not, not, not a part-time worshiper. Not just coming and singing when the anointed, handsome pastor Alex and team are up there singing the melodious sonnet with flaming songs from above. You know, praise God for that. I mean worshiping Him when that's the last stinking thing you want to do and you'd like to say some other words. Oh, you never feel that way. When, you, when, when you're in the midst of the desert and you just don't know, but trusting God and lifting your voice and worshiping Him. I do believe it's being regular to church on Sunday. I do believe it's being committed to a local church and not jumping around like a spiritual, spiritual schizophrenic. Well, I just pointed the body of Christ. Fly everywhere. Go hunt and fish, got no accountability, say you love God. I love hunting and fishing too, but you need, a, you need accountability. You, you need, everybody needs a pastor. You need somebody that you can call a pastor, that you can, that'll pray over you and guard over you and protect you, lead you, guide you, direct you, teach you, equip you for the, thing, for the saints, equipping the saints for the work of ministry. Be a worshiper, Amen. Be a committed tither. 
all of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, they're all tithers. I believe that we need to be a committed tither. Tithing's a covenant act. And um, maybe, maybe you've stopped tithing. Well, start again. I've said it before. It is rather offensive once again. Welcome to KC. Praise the Lord. How are you going to trust God with your eternal salvation if you can't trust him with 10 cents on a dollar? Church doesn't need your money. My, my, my salary's set. It's set. It's, and and it, it doesn't matter whether we continue to grow, which we will. That doesn't affect me. I'm, my salary's set, and I'm thankful. Things are good. That's not the way every church runs, but it is how it runs here. Our salaries on staff are set. So whether you tithe or not, it doesn't, make, it doesn't matter to me. You see, you can't afford not to tithe. You need to learn to tithe because you need God's blessing. You need the Goshen. You need the, the protection, the rebuking, the devourer. There's so many promises. It was very hard for me to start tithing. But now you couldn't get me to stop. Be a person who blesses. Oh, I should touch on the stewardship. Be a tither and be a good steward. If you live beyond your means, you're going to head up in big trouble. You stretch yourself out on credit cards that, that charge 21%, which I personally think is evil, and you're in big trouble. You get stretched out on your credit cards, you're, gonna, you're not going to be the head and the you're not going to be the head, and you're going to be the tail, and, and you're, going to be the, you're going to be the borrower, and you're going to be under bondage. But I think there can also be a bondage of this, this mantra of even some Christians, debt-free, debt-free, debt-free. You know, I'm thankful. Let me give you an example of debt, debt-free. Um, the Bible says, to oh, no man a debt except the debt of love. So I think moving towards that and praying towards that is a good idea. When God gave us our property back, it was appraised at $4 million, tax assessed at three point nine. We put in an offer, and it was accepted at $1,059,000. How many of you know $1,059,000, 3 million worth of equity overnight, pretty good buy. Yeah. Buy low, sell high. And to know the whole story, it's just amazing. So we didn't have a million dollars. We took offerings. We believed God. And in the end, we got a loan from the bank, AG Financial, in fact. God bless them, gave us a loan at 7%. Lord, forgive them. But they, <laughs> but they gave us a loan and we were able to purchase our property, which we wouldn't have been able to do. And as a result, we have a property right now. We put in another half a million dollars worth of work, cash. Uh, it's more than that. All in all, the property's worth, conservatively, five to seven million dollars. So we could flip it right now and say, ching, praise the Lord. But we're not doing that because God has led us to build a building. So if we had the mantra, you see, you can be in bondage to being debt-free and miss out on an opportunity that God can give. Come on, I own my house with the bank. However, I've got a lot of equity. God's blessed me. Anybody been blessed that way? Yeah. So if you say, well, you just have to have all the money right now to buy the house and you don't buy the house, you might miss out on what God wants to do. Believe to pay your house off. You, un you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. Should I tell that testimony now? I probably should. No. Stop the clock. Jesus, help me. Pastor Alex, can you come and play some Goshen music? Be a person who blesses. Everybody say that. Be a person who blesses. That's what, that's what Jacob did. He came to Pharaoh and he blessed him. Look at E. Almost done. Hear the voice of the Lord and obey. Trust and obey. For there's no other way. To be happy in Jesus, you must. All we do is pray and obey. No matter what the Lord says, we obey him. Some of those times are very uncomfortable. The testimony I'm about to share is rather shocking, and the fullness of it is not in just yet, but it certainly has uh, shown itself to be real. Oh. I 
Oh, that's like just water going over my vocal cords right now. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for being patient with me. I'm almost done. Uh, we, have a sat, we have a prayer meeting every day of the week. There's 5 a.m. prayer, 6 a.m. prayer, 7 a.m. prayer. By the way, I've had people say, how is it that the church is, do, how is it that you guys are doing what you're doing? It's prayer, and we can take no credit other than we happen to show up. And when we don't want to show up, we keep showing up. That's it. So the prayer meeting here has been on Saturday through the winter. And uh, it grew, and it was great. We'd be here, men would gather together. Men and women, kind of separate. It's a different prayer meeting on, on, on Saturday, Monday through Friday, and Sunday mornings are a little different. But Saturday, the women would draw out and get separate, and the men would do the same. The springtime came, and I just knew it's time to get our feet back on the property, but it's kind of like, well, not yet. You know, anybody know what I'm talking about? It was cold and kind of rainy and like, you know, let's pray at the church still. But I knew it was time to go back to the property. And my wife says, we need to go back to the property. She said, two weeks ago, we need to change it. I'm like, yeah, you're right, I know. So we changed. Attendance was slashed to a third because it was cold and miserable those first few weeks. So we continue. I'm talking about praying and obeying. You got to hear God's word and you got to obey him. We go just a couple weeks ago and, you know, it's usually about 20 of us or so, sometimes less. We invite you to come out seven o'clock, just drive to the church property. We're there at the upper gate. We walk the property and, and uh, Wally and some of our seniors get in a car and they drive it. God bless them. It's like the Pope mobile or something. Like that. Well, this particular morning, I... Pardon me. This particular morning, I, I get there and I see somebody walking across the property. I mean, they're at a distance. You've been up there. It's large. And um, they're walking. I'm thinking, oh, a trespasser. It's my immediate thought. I'm undoing the lock. They're getting closer. I'm like, I guess he didn't see the signs. They get a little closer. I'm going to have to correct him. They get a little closer. I'm thinking, no, I'm not going to correct him. He's a senior man. And he gets my eye and he kind of waves. I think, well, I'm not going to say anything. Forget it. He gets up to the gate and we're talking. He asks me about the church. I tell him about the church. He asks me about me and he asks about the pastor and I'm like, that's me. And we go on, we talk and testify a little bit and he tells me, I've been walking this property a long time. I say, wow, me too. And uh, he said, yeah, the church used to own that and now the church owns it again. I think that's awesome. I said, yeah, actually, the church that did own it was us. It's the same church. He says, how'd you get, the, how'd you get it back? So I told him the story very quickly. He's like, that's a miracle. I said, yeah. He said, well, I'm on my morning walk. I walk and pray, and so I'm, I'm going to get going. I can tell he's impacted by the story. He walks off. Our prayer meeting starts, and we walk onto the property, and we get to our second location for prayer. And I look across, and I see this man coming back. It's been about 15, 10, 15 minutes now. I see this man coming back across the property. He stops at about 50 to 75 yards, maybe, and he gives, he gives it, he's standing there, gets my attention. And so I walk over, delegate prayer, walk over to him. And he is, he's shaking a little bit. Ho hopefully he'll get to tell you the story himself. He's shaking a little bit. His eyes are filled with tears. And he says, man, I, I don't know what's going on here. I don't know what's going on. I'm like, oh yeah, Jesus. I don't know what's going to happen, you know. I don't know what's going on. I'm like, I know, it's awesome. God's good. I just said, oh, God, thank you. Thank you. I just started praying, thanking God. And he says, I was on my walk. And God spoke to me to turn around, come back down here. He spoke to me to tell you that I need to buy all the concrete. And I, and I sat there. You know what my response is? Yes! I began to worship and I began to cry. I said, it's God. It's God. Because <laughs> it is. He's crying. I'm crying. He's like, God, I'm going to buy the concrete. I'm like, thank you, Jesus. And he begins to qualify himself. It's not like somebody, you know, um, he can buy the concrete. You know. He's like, uh, how big is it? <laughs> 
<laughs> and so I just said, well, it's 69,000, about 70,000 square feet. He's like, all right, no flinch. He's like, all right, well, I've got a concrete company. I said, we have a couple too. So let me connect you. And I connected him with Wally and the whole thing. And he's undone weeping, saying, God's so good. I invited him to church and said, oh, God's so good. And he walked off. And as he's walking off, I just took a picture of this lone man in the middle of the field. He met Wally and everything, and all of that's in the works. Now, I don't know if it's all going to come about, but it shows, let me tell you what it shows. It shows the Spirit of God at work. It shows what happens when you'll obey. I didn't want to roll, I didn't want to take my carcass out of bed just like you don't. I didn't want to, oh, I'm tired, I need rest, I don't feel good, whatever, you know. And when God speaks to you, if you'll just be willing to obey, you don't know the results that will take place. It's Goshen, man. It's living in the promises of God. Funny thing was, is we finished prayer. My wife and I are driving home like, yes, you're so awesome, God. You're so awesome. Thank you, Jesus. We drive home. And like, I don't know how many miles it is. I live probably four miles from the church property. And I drive, I get to my street and there's the guy. It's the same guy. And immediately I'm thinking, could be an angel, could be an angel, watch out. No, really, that's my immediately thought. Whoa, whoa, the dude is appearing on my street. So I stopped and rolled down the window and he's like, hey. I said, hey, what's up? We shook hands again and and he's like, uh, I said, I live right here. He says, no way, I live over here. He said, this is amazing. I said, it's amazing. It's amazing. <laughs> Come on, somebody ought to say hallelujah. Oh, come on. Come on. God can do it. God can do it for you. I suggest you move. I suggest you move to Goshen. I suggest you move to, to the blessings of God, to the promises of God. Exercise your gifting. I'm almost done. I'm out of time. Exercise your giftings. Come on, use the gifts and talents you have. Can you imagine if Joseph didn't, decide, you know, didn't use his gifts? Could have interpreted the dream but not given the full interpretation. Or, you know, I mean, all of them using their giftings. Amazing. Live at peace. Live at peace. We're moving right along because my time is done. Live at peace. Forgive and be forgiven. This is, this is how to get into the blessings, the full blessings of God. You have to ask yourself, if you, all you see is loss, difficulty, emotional pain, strife, that's not an earmark of the blessing of God. The earmark of the blessing of God is what I'm telling you about. So take your life and overlay this and see how you're doing. Are you, are you, are you living in Goshen? Are you living under the blessings? Or are you tolerating some stuff? Listen, you, you need to aggressively hunt down and kill everything that's not of God in your life. You know what I mean by kill. I mean like taking every thought captive. Spiritual act of violence. Live at peace. As far as it depends on you, live at peace. Be reconciled. Everybody say, be reconciled. Reconcile every relationship in your life. Now, I said this in the first service. I'll say it again. Some relationships can't be reconciled because you can't control people. So all you can do is do your part. And after that, it's up to them. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? You can repent. You can... You can make amends, you can, and you should do all of those things. Do your part, but after that, they can still tell you to pound sand and never want to be in your life. You can't do anything about that, but you can pray, and that's doing a lot. You can pray. Come on, I have two, I have two family members that I've been separated from for 20 years. I keep after it. I'll stay after it. I'm going to keep my heart right, and one day, one day, that will change. 
if you're listening, I love you. Be reconciled. God's given us this ministry of reconciliation. Let God restore, lastly, let God restore every area of your life. Don't tolerate that which Jesus set you free from. Don't tolerate that which Jesus gave you a, a, a promise to overcome with. The promises of God are the basis by which we pray. So when you see whatever problem you have in your life, I don't care what it is, emotional, physical, financial, spiritual, sexual, Listen, whatever problem you have, there is a promise to combat that thing, wipe it out so you can move to Goshen, so that you can move and quit tolerating stuff. Just saying, well, at least God loves me. Hey, what, is, what a religious lie. That's the stupidest thing I've, well, maybe not the stupidest I've ever heard, but foolish. Is that better, dear? My wife's, my wife's looking at me. I'm going over here. You can live in the blessings of God. And sometimes we make little religious excuses for why we don't have power, why our marriage isn't blessed, why our kids might not serve God. We don't know everything, but, but believe for restoration in every area of your life. I mean, shoot for the high water mark all the way. Go for the gold. Don't just settle. Years ago, I was lost as lost could be. My mom was saved and praying for me. My brother was saved. My middle brother, I believe, had received the Lord. And a family member said to my mother, well, at least she got two out of three. She said, oh, no. No, there ain't going to be no two out of three either. Three for three, nothing else. I got two other brothers. Thank God she didn't give up on me. Don't you give up. Don't you throw in the towel. Believe for reconciliation in every area of your life.